So here I'm kind of putting on a, a different hat for myself. I am a curator of the bird collection at the University of Kansas. Um, it's a collection of about 120,000 birds from all over the world. And I've worked there for 20 years. When I arrived there, the collection was in a pretty curious state, which is to say the original digitization had been done beginning in 1980. And it was on a platform that no longer existed even 20 years ago. And so the day I walked into my new job, nobody in the bird division knew how to catalog a specimen. And so instead of what what we've been discussing the last few days, which is kind of, how do I get started? This was a very different question. This was, how do I clean up this mess? And it was a huge mess, and it still is. And we've always balanced between a very active field program versus making the database better. And we do both, and we have guilt about about not having focused as much on the database. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine that I walked in to the University of Kansas and no database existed. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to give you my strategy because I know that collection very well. Previous to the University of Kansas, I spent eight years as a doctoral student and then as a curator at the Field Museum in Chicago. And so I was there during the entire data capture effort for the Field Museum. So I'm giving you kind of two major institutions of experience. Um, one very important comment is you're going to find that we deal with smaller numbers of specimens than either the plant people or the insect people do. And so you'd think, well, we should be done. But we, we deal with smaller num numbers of specimens that are also pretty difficult and awkward to handle. Okay? For digitization, the very worst is specimens in alcohol or Form 1. But skeletons and skins are not much, not much better. So yeah, we're dealing with an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude fewer spe specimens, but they present kind of peculiar problems as far as handling them. So let's just kind of walk through this. And again, I'm imagining that I walk into the University of Kansas or you know, some moderate sized collection and there's nothing. How do I start the digitization effort? So this is the, the Natural History Museum. Uh, my office is kind of on the other side of that top floor. Uh, one of the details about our collection is that this is a historical building. It's more than a century old. And it has all of the pluses and minuses of being a historical building. So our space is not ideal. And to some degree, it's not even adequate. Um, these days, we have quite a nice new laboratory of, of preparation. But these photographs are from the previous laboratory, which was quite bad. Um, this is one of my students going through something that is ubiquitous in all bird collections and all mammal collections, which is a freezer full of unprepared material. Um, there are museums on Earth, and I won't mention which ones, but they are in England, um, where they actually catalog specimens that are still frozen and not prepared. But this is material, some of it's local, some of it's regional, some of it we get by trading, and some of it comes in from expeditions. Uh, but it's material that requires somewhere between an hour and a day of work to prepare into a single specimen. So again, that's a difference between vertebrate specimens and plants and insects. We put a lot of time into our specimens, each one of them. That's why our numbers are so small. Those specimens get prepared kind of in three different ways. You can see specimens in alcohol. So this will be familiar to our 
herp and fish people. We also um, clean the skeletons and prepare as, as full skeletons. And finally, we prepare skins, and I'll show you pictures of those in a moment. Um, a problem for birds, I don't know if you noticed, I should have pointed this out to you about the mammals in the zoological collections yesterday. If you looked carefully, the mammal specimens were a skin and then there was a skull tied to the skin. And so the mammal guys have this really nice situation where you can prepare a study skin and have the entire skin but also have a full skeleton. Now think about a bird. You have that bill, and the bill is basically bone and keratin on top. So it's almost impossible to get the bill out of the skin without also removing the bill from the skin, okay? Hands and legs for birds are similarly hard, okay? Bird legs don't have much in the way of separation of skin from bone. Think about a chicken, okay? So we have this problem where we have to choose between preparation types. Am I going to make this into a pickle? Am I going to make this into a skeleton? Or am I going to make this into a skin? If it's a really rare bird, we have little tricks where we can get two of the three out of a single bird. But it's a lot more work. So this is a skeleton halfway prepared. And the reason I put this in here is that here's a field tag, or actually a field number. So it's not the final catalog number because to our estimation, the specimen doesn't really exist until it's finally prepared and completely stabilized. And this is something where every so often there's an accident with a skeleton and it never comes to exist as a specimen. But this was a doctoral student of mine, Nathan Rice, and who knows what bird it is that he collected. It came back as a mummified skeleton with meat. We put Christiane's insects to good use and, and had some dermestid beetles uh, working for us. They're very low salary, so you get a lot of work out of them. And they clean up the skeleton, and then you just have to go in and clean up this garbage, which is pieces of, of insects and things like that. Um, you clean it up. The worst part of it is you number every bone with the final catalog number. But what I wanted you to see is that this field number sticks with the specimen essentially all the way through to the final data record. <coughs> we do field catalogs, and essentially each one of these catalogs either goes out on an expedition and comes back, and eventually we bind it and scan it. But also, uh, some of these catalogs are for projects. So like I have a big project that doesn't involve any field work, but it's on jungle fowl. And so all the jungle fowl that come in go into one catalog. And this is what it looks like. Um, essentially, you've got a header that gives the locality information. And then you've got information on one individual specimen, another, another, and another. Okay, we still do this the way it was done in the 19th century. It's India ink on 100% rag paper. Now we're, we're getting a little bit more modern in that we're now double booking. And so we're doing electronic cataloging in the field, but also this. And I have been in situations where a camp got flooded. And so we walked down the stream and picked up the catalog pages that had washed away the computer if we'd had one, would have been dead. But we picked up the catalog pages, washed them, and hung them up to dry, and they're perfect. So this is a database management system that is fail safe, but you can imagine that has to be written for every individual specimen. So it's time consuming, that's why we go slow. When I'm at my most efficient, I'm spending 50 to 60 minutes in preparing each individual specimen. When I arrived at KU to catalog a specimen, again, we were double booking. It was the digital catalog, once we made adjustments so that we knew how to catalog things, and everything got written in a paper ledger. 
and probably each one of the institutions that we're hearing from also has paper ledgers, but they've left them behind, and we left this behind about 18 years ago. So essentially we trust in our digital catalog and we back it up and we have copies that you know, I send to my mother and if, if a disaster knocks out that copy and our copy, it's a pretty big disaster, okay? The ledger looks like this and you can imagine some poor technician sitting there and writing out the scientific name. Yet another bird from whatever site that is, looks like it's in the Neotropics, the date, the collector, et cetera, et cetera. It's not the full data set, which is another reason not to do the paper ledger. It was just simply impossible to write out all the data that were associated with the specimen. So this was kind of a piece of our database management system that we were happy to leave behind. Now, why am I giving you all this information? If I were to take on a new data capture project, the very first thing that I would do is spend a week with the curator and the collections manager or whoever takes care of that collection. And I'd figure out all of these places where information is held. The field catalogs, we're going to look at specimen labels in a moment, the collections ledgers. Sometimes these ledgers are beautiful and complete and annotated very meticulously. And I will show you one situation in which we had to digitize from the ledgers, even though I don't like them and they're com incomplete and all that. So again, that first part of the task is to understand that particular collection. And in fact, you have to understand that particular collection through time. Because what I do as curator at Kansas since 1993 is very different from what C.D. Bunker did in 1920s. Okay, so you have to understand the whole lineage of information management on paper, just on tags, whatever, but you have to understand it. Another piece of our puzzle is field notes. Um, this is a, a tradition, this particular system is a tradition that was started by Joseph Grinnell, who is the founder of the institution where John Wachorek works, the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. And Grinnell instituted a very beautiful field information management system, all on paper. But essentially what he did was, you kept three different notebooks. One notebook was about your itinerary. I went to this place, I set camp at this place. They didn't have GPS units, but they described the localities meticulously. Many times they have photographs of the sites. Your second field book is your catalog, and your catalog has localities that refer to the first field book. This is a relational database, okay? And your third field book was notes about each individual species. And so you can, you see these three volumes here, that's field itinerary, field catalog, and field notes on species. And so it's a really, really rich data stream. And if you want to see a spectacular example of it, go to the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology website, and they have computerized the entire field note collection uh, that Grinnell and his intellectual descendants created. One of his intellectual de uh, descendants came to Kansas and kind of started this system. Um, now we keep field notes, but not in such an organized fashion. So all of these are bound on the shelf. At some point we'll digitize them because they actually offer even more information about the specimens that isn't on the tags. You know, the real details of the camp where I caught this bird was situated in a canyon with trees on the sides. You know, there's more detail than I get from just the specimen. So this is another dimension of our information that I had to come to understand 
And in this case, I set it aside. I'll deal with it 